Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. So a lot of things to go over, so let's just get right into it. So first of all, jobs reports came out. And this is a uh, non-farm payroll. And you can see that uh, this time has gone on. We've had a uh, declining amount of payroll growth. And this was one of the worst ones that we've had in quite some time. And we can see that just last month, September 2024, it was at 223,000. And now we're at 12,000. So what the heck? What the heck happened? Well, according to this article, which I don't really believe too much, it talks about hurricanes decimated non-farm payroll growth. And then also because of a Boeing strike. Look, hurricanes were not in the entire complete United States. So to go from just 223,000 to 12,000 is a little crazy. And not only on top of that, but you have to remember that uh, these numbers are going to be revised downwards because these are just pretty much estimations going forward. And actually, I believe they've actually uh, reduced September and August already. So if we can go, if we have to go down even more so uh, for these uh, uh, job growths or payrolls growth, it's going to be pretty uh, decimated. And then just to give a quick overview, here's the October jobs, monthly jobs growth is up. 12,000, that's not percent. That's just straight up 12,000 numbers. And we'll see if it gets revised. Unemployment did uh, go down a little bit, 4.1%. And you need to see that by selected industries, manufacturing, this is in thousands, is down 46,000 retail trade, 6,400. Utilities, 1,000. Professional business, 47,000. Education health is up, which is pretty crazy here in the United States because we are one of the most obese countries in the entire world, but sure. And then average hourly pay, and, it, and this looks like it's great at 4%, but again, this is over 12 months, so don't get too excited about that. But again, just to reiterate, uh, to talk about what I should have said in the beginning, non-farm payroll represents the change in jobs in the economy over the previous month. It doesn't include farm workers, which makes sense, non-farm payrolls, private household employees, or nonprofits. So right now, we sent a little bit of a dip, and we'll see what that means going forward into the presidential election, which is coming up on Tuesday. But to me, honestly, the books are already cooked. The numbers are coming out, and that's just pretty much what it is. So we'll see if it affects anything. I think right now everybody knows who they're going to vote for. So let's just uh, let's just let the numbers churn in. So we'll see what actually happens. So that is on the macro side. Let's get into the crypto side. And unfortunately. We have to tiptoe in with our buddy Gary Gensler over at the SEC as we just have a number coming in as to how much Gary Gensler and the SEC as their enforcement by, by regulation has really cost this industry. Yesterday on uh, NFA Live, we our last question that we had was, does it really matter which president comes in? And we all pretty much agreed it really doesn't matter which president is it going to be, if it's going to be Harris or if it's going to be Trump, that crypto, digital assets, Bitcoin will endure. However, you have to understand that it'll do fine. It'll do just great moving forward, but it can slow things down. Imagine what would happen if we didn't have Gary Gensler doing this regulation by enforcement. Imagine if we had, I don't know, like Brian Brooks, somebody from the OCC who was, who was heavily positive for digital assets. Imagine if he was the head of the SEC where we would be right now, as opposed to what Gary has done. I think it's not about who's in there, it's just about how much you can actually slow it down. So this little piece just lays it out. According to a self-reported figures collected and anonymized and aggregated by Harris X, the US digital asset industry has spent more than $400 million defending itself against Gendo's SEC. With un and of course, that's just the numbers of just how much they have to spend. But you're talking about losses of jobs, innovation, U.S. investment. Oh, and also the fact that you're pushing these projects to another location. Nobody wants to come here and actually build things. Uh, they're just moving across the way, moving, just jumping over the pond. The advocacy group said the 400 million figure is a small slice of the industry, given that it's from a sample of blockchain association members. Group's members include Ripple, who got torched essentially by the SEC for the last two years. Coinbase, same thing. Crypto.com, Grayscale, and Kraken. Well, Grayscale kind of uh, might have deserved it, but that is horrible. 
but uh, we'll see if whoever comes in for the next president uh, gets rid of Gary. Now, they can't fire him, but usually what happens is as a new administration comes in, and it'll be a new administration, uh, as they come in, a lot of times that the people will just step down. So let's hopefully that's what it is. But to piggyback on top of this, you may have noticed that, uh, I don't know if you hold this token, but in the top 50, Immutable X. Well, actually now it's ranked number 51 because it fell 14% today. And why was that? It's because Gary just hit them with the Wells notice. So Immutable said it received a notice from the SEC related to the sale of its Immutable X token in 2021. Let's break that down real quick. You're telling me that it took them roughly three years to figure out, hey, this may have been a, a security sale and we need to actually get on top of Immutable X and make sure that uh, we give them a hard time. Well, that's where we're at. So again, it's very hard enough to get into this industry and try to pick winners when you are essentially fighting with at least one hand tied behind your back as Gary and the SEC is making it harder for you. So sorry about that. That's just called regulation by enforcement, and we'll see how it all plays out. But if I was you, this does not look good for Immutable X. And for all the bad news we just talked about, let's take a look at the good, Bitcoin. Take a look at the ETF and how successful it is. There's also something we'd like to compare that with, and that is gold. US Bitcoin ETFs amass over half of gold's holdings in its first year. And that was very interesting because I always take a look at gold and I think to myself, why don't gold is roughly 11 and a half trillion market cap. Like, why don't we have more of that market share? I personally own gold and silver in my Roth IRA, but I just take a look at them like, why is there so much? But anyhow, here's what we have. So since, since launching in January 2024, Bitcoin ETS have attracted substantial inflows, totaling 23 billion inflow and 70 billion in total net assets. What does that mean? So they're actually taking this information from so-so value. And if you take a look at it, the cumulative total net inflow, again, that is the net amount that has come in versus the net outflow. Because if you take a look at like Grayscale, they do a lot of outflowing, not a lot of inflowing. So over time, it's been positive 24 billion. But there's another number, the total net assets which is 70, almost 71 billion. Total net assets are essentially the valuation of what this has during the time of the total inflows and outflows, even though it's been positive the whole time. So it's been about almost 71 billion. What does this mean? Well, this means that in just 10 months, spot Bitcoin ETFs have amassed over 50% of the assets held by gold which have been around by two decades. And total net assets for US listed gold ETFs stand at $137 billion, which if you take a look at it, isn't too far off. So they have 70 billion here, 50% of the 137, eh, roughly or so. And that's in a very short amount of time. So again, when I take a look at this and I think to myself, wait a second, I mean, why aren't we there yet? Well. I mean, net flows in and out, we're still positive. And I've said this since day one, I mean, since this has been going on. Ethereum ETF, not so much. We can see that, again, the inflows that are coming in minus the outflows, we've been positive all the way through 2,700. And I think we hit an all-time high. Actually, we just hit it today, on October 30, actually yesterday, I would say, October 31st. And even though there are certain ETF holders, Fidelity, ARK, Bitby, but you also have BlackRock that just keeps on scooping up uh, Bitcoin moving forward. So again, when I take a look at this, I'm just like, there's such a an opportunity for Bitcoin. Now remember, because of the market cap it being so high, I wanna say around 1.3, 1.4 trillion, uh, for Bitcoin to move, it takes a lot. But again, there's a lot of money sloshing out around there. The world's gold, like I said, is $11.5 trillion. That's a lot. That's a lot of money just sloshing around in gold. Billionaires themselves, they have $12 trillion of that. Well, $12 trillion of uh, their valuation. Central bank balance sheets, you're looking at $28 trillion. The S&P 500 is $36 trillion. Global money supply, uh, you're looking at $82 trillion. And then 
the global stock markets, take them all together, I think it's like $108 trillion. And there's another big one down here, real estate, 320 trillion and derivatives. I wanna say it's 600 trillion or close to a quadrillion, which is actually a real word. So when I'm taking a look at this, I'm like, man, there's some massive opportunities out there and we'll see how long it takes. But remember that if you're into Bitcoin, like a lot of people are, myself included, sometimes, and I put this out today, you gotta get, if you're rich, you gotta get rich by taking lots of risk with small amounts of money. And you stay rich by taking small amounts of risks with lots of money. So I don't know where you're at in your journey. If you're just, you know, just dishing out things by taking a mass amount of risk with, with small amounts of money, or you're taking small amounts of risk with just lots of money. Um, if you're gonna get risky, it really comes down to altcoins. I think the easiest play is Bitcoin. This isn't financial advice, it's just what I'm doing. But if you go down that list in altcoins, I think that's where mo most of the opportunity is. And one of the big opportunities is, and people will say, well, is it Ethereum, is it Solana? Is it Avalanche? Is it Chainlink? Is it whatever it is? Well, think, think of it this way. And I know that Ethereum hasn't been doing too hot, especially in the ETF situation. I know we've been talking about outflows, but I want you to do something. Outflows. This was an article. It's pretty interesting. Ethereum reclaims 42% outflows from Solana. Because I know everybody talks about how great Solana is. And it is. I mean, it works pretty well. I know some people absolutely despise it because, you know, sometimes it goes down. I don't know the last time it's been down, but sure. It's still in beta, they say, even though Fire Dancer is coming out. They do say there's a lot of bot activity. Okay, gotcha. They do say there's a lot of bot of inflation and it's unsustainable. Okay, sure. But it actually works and it works pretty well. And people are just saying, well, it works so well, I'm just going to get away from Ethereum. And it, some of the times I look at that and go the same thing. But this article was pretty good because it talks about the TVL and what's being stolen away. And TVL is total value locked. And actually, let me pull this up so this will make sense. If you take a look at the TVL for all chains, it's about $115 billion. And Ethereum itself has 60, roughly 65 billion, so the lion's share. Tron has some, Solana's got 7.6, uh, Binance Smart Chain 5.9. And then you got a bunch of like layer twos, Base and Arbitrum and Polygon and stuff like that. Sui only has like 1.3. So if you are Solana, you want to hoover away or suction away all of this or get as much total value lock as you possibly can. And what this article was saying was like, like look, the only thing that really matters for, for Solana is pulling TVL from Ethereum. That's where all the value sits. Is it happening? Not really. And it gets into some on-chain analysis. I'm just going to say, say, take it with a grain of salt. But I linked this website in the description because I'd like you to take a look at this and review this to make sure that this is right. What we're taking a look at is this is Artemis. And it talks about the net flows by chain. Remember, net flows, the net so positive and negative flows. And we can just see that, you know, in one day, that hasn't been that much over here, that SWE is the big winner. Ethereum is doing pretty well. Arbitrum, which is the layer two solution. Solana, doing pretty good. But then you got Base, Clayton, Moonbeam, Polygon, Avalanche. Top 15 outflows, Ethereum, right? So inflows, outflows. So what does that mean? Well, if you take, a, take the average of those two, you can see that Ethereum is outflowing quite a bit in one day. And this is what people will point to and they'll say, see, Ethereum sucks. But just take a look at it. When in doubt, zoom out, right? I'm not telling you to get into Ethereum. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying this, this is one piece of data you should be taking a look at as far as flows. So over seven days, Ethereum, Ethereum. But then base over seven days is the big winner. And base is a layer two solution. Polygon is a layer two solution or a side chain or whatever it wants to call it this week. I don't, I can't ever keep up with Polygon. Sui's doing okay. And then there's Solana, BNB chain and Clayton. Now let's take a, let's go even farther out. How about a month? Ethereum, Ethereum, base, Solana, Polygon, Sui, BNB chain. What about over three months? Ethereum, Ethereum. Solana was the big winner over the last month. That's true. 
What about over a year time frame? Ethereum, Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, Base. Top three of the last year have been layer two solutions. It wasn't Ethereum, it was layer twos. And I think that's the future for Ethereum because God knows if you use the layer one solution, it sucks. It sucks, it's slow, and it's expensive. And there's Solana saying number four. So is there enough room for everybody? I think there is. But I just wanted you to be aware of what's going on and take a look at those on-chain metrics from Artemis so you can make a relatively informed decision. And that's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Let me talk about it's time sensitive. Now, if you want to go over a little q and see there's a bunch of questions already. I'll answer the question to the best of my abilities, and uh, we'll go from there. If you got to take off, take off. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.